All right, uh, this is Samuel Well, We're doing Heaven and Hell. Um, when we first decided this topic, we didn't exactly know how much content we would have, but there was a lot more than we thought, okay? Um, but we're going to get into the preface. It is a, it's a hot topic. Uh, when we wrote that down, there's no pun intended, but it's funny. Uh, but it is a hot topic. Hell is a huge thing in our culture right now. A lot of uh, people are against it. A lot of people are pushing for it. Um, some people push for it uh, too much. But we're going to navigate how much we should say about it and how should we kind of interact with culture when it comes to hell. Yeah. Um, another thing is that Jesus preached hell. That's something we're going to say a couple of times throughout this. It was the number one thing he preached. That was the number one topic. Uh, he preached hell more than anything else. Uh, next, it is essential. It's an essential doctrine to the Christian faith, and you'll you'll understand why hell needs to be a thing in order for the Bible and Christianity to be true. All right, um, but we can pray really quick and get into it. All right, uh, dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for bringing us all here today. I ask that you just allow the Spirit to work in all of our minds and hearts, and let us learn something and. Let us learn how to engage with our current culture so we can preach your word. In your name we pray, amen. amen. All right. All right, so we're going to start with a quote. Oh, actually, I actually have two quotes. First one is just the Bible verse that is really good from uh, 1 John 3, 2. It says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. So mm -hmm. that's just a the one biblical description of um, heaven and something we some people might call the beatific vision, but it's a very lovely image of what heaven would be like. Yeah. The next quote is from Jonathan Edwards, the great <clears throat> Puritan theologian. He says, "Almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it." All right, <clears throat> so we're going to break this up into, well, topics, heaven and hell. We're going to start with heaven. Uh, we're going to start with the definition, though. So uh, a couple points to be made on the definition of hell is, is first, or oh, not hell, heaven, yeah, is we have a lack of experience. So we haven't actually been there. We haven't experienced it firsthand. So we can't actually say, hey, this, ex this is exactly what it was like, mm -hmm. okay? Another thing is that heaven is unique. So in the Bible, we will be talking about things analogically. So we can only do mild comparisons and say, hey, this has some element of what heaven might be like. But ultimately, we don't really know. We can't give a literal description because, um, again, it's unique and it's not like any other object we know on earth. Okay. Like when John describes it in Revelation, all he's able to say is things like, I saw this and it was like this. That's like all he's able to come up with. And so we, we that's basically all we have to go on is analogical descriptions of heaven. Yeah. And so when it comes to heaven and defining it, it's easy to say what it's not, actually. it's a um, So we can clear up the misconceptions or, or the lies about it so we don't have false images or false ideas about heaven. Uh, and that'll help us a lot to understand what we can, right? Um, and the last thing uh, for, the, for the definition part I'm going to talk about is in the, the Bible, biblical authors talked about two different kinds of heavens. So sometimes they would talk about like, oh, the heavens and the earth. So like the, the stars and uh, pretty much outer space, they, they would refer to that sometimes as the heavens. That's not the heaven we're talking about. The heaven we're addressing is uh, when we're finally meeting God in the afterlife um, after all of this has faded away. And it's new. Okay. Uh, we'll have some scripture. Yeah. So some scripture verses that we do have that kind of talk about like giving us a hint about what heaven is like. Uh, Hebrews 11:16 says, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city. So we get this image too in Revelation of the new Jerusalem. So we have an image of, of um, it being a city or a kingdom in heaven. Uh, John 14, 2, it says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? So you see again this idea of Jesus preparing a place for the elect, those who are going to be saved, um, that he's preparing a place for them, which is very encouraging. And then Revelation 22, kind of the most lengthy, lengthy like 
most literal description we have of heaven. It says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And then, last one, Revelation 21, 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to clear up some misconceptions. So first one is that heaven is clinical and boring. So as you can see from the descriptions that Will just gave from the scripture, it's it's not clinical and boring. What we, what we mean by that is like, oh, you die and then wake up in some place that's just like pure white and like a doctor's office or something like yeah. that. Heaven is not like that. It's actually very image rich how it's described to us in the Bible. It's going to be a uh, beautiful, exciting, uh, satisfying, um, and amazing pretty much. So it's not boring or clinical. Next one, a misconception. Everyone will be there. Uh, so that would be universalism. So everyone gets to go to heaven. It's, it's not going to be like that. The only people that go to heaven we're going to talk about it a little more later is the people who believe in Jesus Christ and put their trust in Christ. So the elect, pretty much. Uh, so that's another misconception. So it's not universalism. Mm -hmm. uh, next thing. Some people think that it's just like spiritual, that we'll go there and we're just spirits floating around all the time and that's, and that's it. Now, that's also a misconception. Mm -hmm. So we were created and designed as body and spirit. So we're both. Um, so when... In Revelation, it act, actually in a couple spots in the New Testament, it talks about a new heaven and a new earth. So it's going to be a physical and spiritual place. So think of like the Garden of Eden. So the kingdom of God meets earth, mm -hmm. and that's what it will be like, physical and spiritual. All right? Yes. So who goes to heaven? I think to understand this question, we have to understand the whole gospel story to some extent. We see that every story kind of goes through the structure of a origin, a fall, a redemption, a restoration, a consummation to all things. This is really the, every story that we see in, in movies or, or books, and it's kind of all based off of the grand story that we're actually a part of right now. So we see in the gospel, we see that God created us to be in relationship with him, and then man fell. We rebelled against him. The Son of God was then sent to fix what we could not restore ourselves. The Spirit of God was then also sent to unite us back to God. Uh, and make us more like him. And then uh, depending on like where people um, choose to go, uh, eternity will then be um, with God or without God, separated from him. Mm -hmm. So how are we brought back to God? We are brought back to God by what we call union with Christ. So we are united to Christ by faith and repentance, and that is how we are saved. The Spirit unites us to Christ by faith and repentance. Um, I think it'd be important for us to talk a little bit about what that really means and what true faith is, as opposed to, um, I think, what a lot of people might think faith is. Uh, we think true faith is a, a faith that saves is not a, a mere intellectual assent. It's more, that's like what the demons have in James 2. Uh, true saving faith is a, a wholehearted yielding trust in God. It's like a giving of oneself to God. I like the word consecration. It's a consecrating oneself to God. It's like, I'm giving all that I am to you, Lord. I'm giving my life to you. Like we use that term kind of lightly, giving your giving your life to Jesus, but what that really entails is is quite a bit. It's giving your entire self to God. Um, it's not a not a mere intellectual assent. A good picture of faith for the, for the Christian is like the tax collector in Luke 18, who who beats his breast when he sees Jesus and he says, "Have mercy on me, a sinner," and he's just broken over his sin. So um, we're seeking forgiveness from a place of true contrition. That's faith and repentance. Um, and just some some. Great quotes from some awesome Protestant authors that talk about what faith is, what saving faith is, who believe in faith alone. Uh, it is therefore faith alone which justifies, and yet the faith which justifies is not alone. Just as it is the heat alone of the sun which warms the earth, and yet in the sun it is not alone because it is constantly conjoined with light. That's from John Calvin. Great Protestant author talking about faith. Uh, and again, we confess with Paul that no other faith justifies but a faith working through love. So if, if, you're, if your faith isn't one that works 
by way of love, it's not a saving faith. That's from Galatians 5.6. Another way to think about it is that good works are necessary not for salvation, but from salvation is a good way to think about it. Or faith is doing good works before you're even asked is another way I think about it, which is helpful. So just that's what saving faith really is, we think, and that's what we think the Bible teaches. <clears throat> All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be going through some objections for heaven. So a lot of atheists will say, hey, heaven doesn't exist because of this reason. Um, and I'm going to kind of answer it. So uh, there, are, there are actually a lot more objections than this. So when we were researching it, that for, for pretty much every single objection or argument for something we're going to go over, there was like 15 to 20 arguments. And so we kind of picked out the ones that we thought were best or most helpful or most relatable or um, something like that. But... Uh, the first one you are probably going to hear is, oh, it's wishful thinking. Heaven is wishful thinking because you're scared or that's just what you want. Um, now, the, the only thing is that wishful thinking would be aimed at the self. So it would be what I want. Oh, I want this to happen. Um, and that's my wishful thinking. The, the only problem with that is the Christian would not describe heaven at like aimed at the self. So it wouldn't be a selfish thing. It would be aimed at God and the Christian faith and uh, the gospel message. That's what it would be aimed at. It wouldn't be aimed at the self, so it wouldn't be wishful thinking. Um, that's the first thing. Uh, second thing, some people might say it's escapism, like, hey, you're escaping the reality of death just to get away from it. Um, and we, we wouldn't say that we're escaping that fear right there. We would actually kind of flip it around and just say it's actually f the fulfillment of our deepest desires. So C.S. Lewis addresses... This And he actually says something uh, like, he says, if I find a desire in myself in which nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explana explanation is that I was made for another world. So it's, it's described as a fulfillment of our desires and not escaping a fear. All right. Uh, some atheists might say, hey, God is bribing you to follow him. He's saying, hey, if you follow me, I won't send you to hell. I'll give you this really nice place called heaven. Um, so the Christian wouldn't say that it's a bribe or we're accepting a bribe. We would say we're, we're getting on a team and we're wanting victory. So the, the question I would ask is, is it bad for a team that has worked hard to want victory? Right? Christians have worked hard. We've taken part in the Great Commission. Uh, Jesus died, and obviously he, he made the promise, like, hey, I'm going to eventually completely and totally defeat evil. So is it bad for us to want victory? Would that be a bribe? I would say, no, that's not a bribe. That would be us being part of the team and wanting victory over the thing we're all working together for, right? Next, uh, an objection you'll hear is um, free will. You aren't going to be free in heaven, uh, because there's no sin. There's no freedom to sin. All right. A way you can respond to that is that uh, our wills will be the most free and they will be perfected. So just because sin isn't there or we aren't going to do it doesn't mean we're not free. As in, we're freely doing this good thing and being with God. Um, and that's something we're actually doing. It's, it, it, it doesn't, like, sin not being there doesn't change anything. Mm -hmm. All right. It doesn't force us to, to then be there. Right. Uh, then the l next one is it's pre-scientific. So some people would say, oh, it's pre-scientific. It's just some primitive superstition, some idea that uh, people a long time ago made up. So the only thing I would say about this is it's self-refuting. So that statement right there isn't a scientific statement. So people that would use this would be like, oh, you have to have science to prove this. You have to follow science, and, well, they aren't using science right there. So it would be a self-refuting argument. All right, next one. Okay, yeah, so what is hell? What can we say about hell from, from Scripture, and, and how can we think about this idea, um, this reality? So some descriptions. We think that it would be fair to say that hell is an absence of heaven, and what we mean by that is an absence of God. It's a separation from God. It's a state where you are completely separated from God, who is the source of all goodness. So you're separated from everything that's good, um, the only true source of goodness. And so there's no good there at all. Not in the person, not around you, there's just no goodness there. It's a complete absence of all good. Um, we'd say that it's our, against our design, that human beings were not created for hell, they were created for God. And so it is against our design and wrong for human beings, properly speaking, to be in hell. 
Uh, it's wrong because it's against our design. It's not what we were made for. Um, but we would also say that it is a just, uh, a just punishment. It is a place of where cosmic justice is actually done, where wrongdoing is, is, is justly punished. Um, if you are made and you spit in the face of your creator, who is the ultimate source of goodness, who deserves all glory and honor and praise, and you repudiate that, then it is just to be separated from him for eternity. Some scripture verses that speak about hell. Matthew 10, 28 says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 25, 41 says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's Jesus talking. Revelation 20.10 says, and the, day, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So that kind of hints to the idea that hell is an eternal reality. A lot of Christians today want to take uh, what's called the annihilationist view of hell, which is the idea that after a certain amount of time, God will just kind of wipe out everybody that's in hell. Maybe a more palatable idea to some people. Um, but we can go over a, a little bit later why I don't think that that works, and I don't think that's what the Bible is teaching. Um, some misconceptions about hell. Probably the biggest one that you've heard maybe from atheists is that hell is just kind of going to be a big party. Uh, I, I want to go to hell. Heaven's the boring part. Heaven's going to be like a worship service forever, and I, don't, I didn't like that church service as a kid, and so heaven's going to be super boring. Um, and so hell's going to be way better because basically Satan's this kind of cool uncle figure who's going to be like the leader of the party, and everybody else is going to be just having a good time. We don't think that that's going to be true. Uh, God's sovereign over everything that's happening in, in, in heaven and hell, and I don't think that people are going to be enjoying hell. It's not a party. All one is left with in hell is one's own crabbed, hardened heart, separated from all goodness. There's nothing good left in a person when they are in hell. Nothing good in a person is being punished there. There's nothing good within a person there. It's all just thoroughly a corrupted heart. Um, they're simply left with a reality that they've cemented themselves into their whole life of continual rejection of God. So there will be no fruits of the Spirit. There will be no traces of goodness there. There won't be any patience or self-control or goodness or kindness or gentleness. There will be no love at all. There will be a complete absence of love. It will not be a party in any sense. If hell is false, if this whole doctrine of hell is false, what are the consequences of that? Well, Jesus is a liar. It's the number one thing that he preached about. So we have to say that Jesus is a liar if we want to deny the doctrine of hell. Our choices no longer make a difference. It's all kind of a wash in the end. Hitler and Mother Teresa would end up in the same spot, um, which would not be ultimately just. The ultimate worst things in the world would not be righted in the end. And also Christ's sacrifice would be completely pointless if there is no hell. There's a lot of consequences to denying this doctrine. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to go over what hell is not, just to get rid of a bunch more misconceptions, just because there are a lot. So one thing we can say hell is not is universalism, so uh, it's not like everyone's going to go there, but again, it's not going to be unpopulated, so it's not everyone's going to heaven, so um, again, mm -hmm. people are going to be there. Next, hell exists only in this life. Some people are like, well, people that don't believe they're already in their own hell right now. Well, that's not hell right there. Um, so hell exists in the afterlife. It's not happening right now just because someone doesn't believe. Um, next, hell is not purgatory. So it's not some place uh, that's in between hell and heaven, right? It's not like some place that um, souls go to chill until they wait out their time, right? Next, hell is not reincarnation. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to hell and then reincarnating as something else in this world to get another chance. Mm -hmm. So hell is eternal. It's the final destination or one of the final destinations. There is no second chance after hell. Um, temporary. Some people say hell is temporary. It is not temporary. So there are some people who believe that the people in hell will be there for a certain amount of time and then God will like purge them of evil and bring them with him. No, it is eternal. So um, I think Will might have touched on this already, but people in hell will keep on sinning, so they will keep getting more punishment is eternal. Uh, next, again, it's not going to be empty. People are going to be there, okay? It's it's not Jesus saved every single person, no matter what they do. It's People are going to be there. It's not empty. Next, it's not limbo. Uh, again, it's not some place where spirits are, are stuck. It's, it's an actual destination where people go and it's their final destination okay and then the last one is hell is not forced so um pretty much no matter uh, what view you hold with christianity the common phrase that 
pretty much everyone can affirm is if I'm saved, it's because of God. If I'm in hell, it's because of me, right? So if we're in hell, it's not because God is forcing us to be there. It's because we actually did something bad, right? Um, but those are the things that hell is not. Right. So who goes there? So that's kind of a picture of, of Gollum, I think, is the idea there. And it's kind of the idea of like, if you kind of like see the Lord of the Rings story, like he's given so many chances. And you know, at the very end of the story of Lord of the Rings, there's three eagles that come to pick up Frodo and Sam and Gollum too. And the third eagle was meant for Gollum and he wasn't there because he chose in the end um, himself, which is really sad when you think about that. Anyway, I'm gonna cry now. Uh, <laughs> but um, who goes there? Hell is made for Satan and his minions. We heard in that Revelation verse earlier that uh, that's what hell was made for, and it's prepared for Satan and his minions. Uh, it's not principally made for human beings. It's not what we were made for, um, and not uh, properly what our dwelling place should be. Uh, but we also have to keep in mind that no one deserves heaven either. Um, heaven is a gratuitous gift. Nobody deserves it. Um, but who will also go there is all humanity who are separated from Christ, who are not united to him by faith. Um, and nothing good will be left in a person there. So who goes there is basically um, thoroughly evil and corrupted hearts continually rejecting God, is I think what we can say. Yeah. That's actually another reason we picked the, the photo right there, that image, is we think Gollum is a good representation of us to look at of what it would look like for nothing good to be left in a person. If you've read the books or watched the movies, that obsession or corruption from the One Ring uh, kind of got rid of everything normal or that would possibly be good or righteous in him, right? So it's a pretty scary photo. Um, why, why should we believe in hell? So there are some reasons why we should believe in hell. Um, so these are like quick arguments, not like a full-on logical argument. But one, the Bible assures hell. So uh, it, it talks about it all the time. That's why one reason we should believe in it. Next, Jesus said so. So again, if hell is not real, Jesus is a liar. Jesus said hell exists, so that's one reason we should believe in it. Next, church. the church has always taught it. It's been a part of church history since the church began. So hell has been taught by the church. Next, justice demands it. If there wasn't a place like hell, justice couldn't be brought out uh, or justice couldn't be completed, right? So if God is just, there has to be a place like hell. Next, hell follows from the holiness of God. So if God is holy and can't be in the presence of sin, then there has to be a place where all sinful things are or dwell that are absent and separated from God, okay? Um, next, human free will. Again, if, um, if we are able to choose things, so if we're able to accept Christ or accept that offer or, or something like that, then there would have to be the alternative. What if we reject God? So God isn't going to force us to be in heaven even if we, if we don't uh, want it. So pretty much that would say, okay, if we do reject Christ and we go to hell and, and it's, it's all because of us. Uh, there, there has to be a place for those people that reject God. So mm -hmm. if there's only one option and those people reject him, well, then they would have to actually go to that place, which would be heaven. So there has to be two places uh, just based on how our choices work. Mm -hmm. Another one. Uh, this actually comes from C.S. Lewis. He made the argument of all desires correspond to an object. So that was that earlier quote for that was an argument for heaven. Like if, if I find in, in myself a desire in which nothing that is in this world could satisfy, then the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. That was his desire argument. And he, he argued that, okay, hunger, the object of desire is food, okay? Next, heaven the, is the object of goodness and pleasure, that desire, the desire to be good or have pleasure. Heaven is the object of that desire. Now we can also flip it and say fear. The object of fear is hell. Okay? And that's a that's another reason to believe in hell. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so this slide might be some of the most new information or just stuff you haven't heard before. Uh, we honestly had to learn a lot about some of these terms uh, coming into this. But these are basically all the different descriptions and 
biblical terms that are used to describe either heaven or hell or the afterlife or the underworld, kind of in general. The Bible itself doesn't speak, especially in the Old Testament, as clearly, just like heaven and hell. And they're these like, uh, realities that we have like really concrete in our heads now. Um, it's a little bit more obscure to some extent, and the terms that are used are different, and also there's language differences at play here with, with Greek and Hebrew. And so just kind of giving an overview of some of the different terms that we see. Mm -hmm. um, but the first one that you probably heard a lot is Sheol, which you hear all the time in the Psalms, David talking about how he is to be delivered from Sheol. Uh, and this is kind of the Old Testament usage for the following th three descriptions, or the following three terms after it, which is Hades, Gehenna, and Tartarus, which perhaps you've never heard before. Um, so to go through those, Hades is basically the underworld. It's basically the biblical term for the underworld. It's the place of the dead, generally speaking. Um, both uh, damned souls and eventual souls that will be raised with God uh, go to Hades, actually. So we think of Hades as kind of a negative thing. Um, and that's also kind of like from Greek mythology and stuff. We have this idea of Hades being like the god of death. But Hades is just a kind of a, a general term for the place of the dead. And it's basically everyone is there to await the final judgment and the final day of resurrection where everyone will be raised. Okay. Gehenna is the, I think, the Greek New Testament word that is most used for hell. And this is referring to like everlasting punishment for damned souls. And so this is for unrighteous individuals. And that the term refers to the continual burning pit of garbage that was outside of the city walls of Jerusalem. Um, they had this garbage pit that was always on fire, and this is the term used for Gehenna. Or, yeah, and so that's what we typically think of as hell. Uh, and so that kind of hints at what the nature of hell is like to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh, and the next is Tartarus, which is used a little bit less frequently. It's in Job. Um, but it is basically this place that we have, it's called basically the imprisonment for the fallen angels. Really interesting. So there's all these different terms from like Greek and Hebrew that are being used to describe the afterlife, um, which is just interesting to kind of do a study into. Um, and then we have like paradise or Abraham's bosom, and I kind of lump these together. So Abraham's bosom is not explicitly in scripture, but paradise is. When Jesus is on the cross and he says, today you'll be with me in paradise, he says that to the good thief. Um, I, I kind of have both of these lumped together because I think that they're both getting at the same idea. So when we are when we die right now, we aren't like raised immediately with our new bodies. The new heavens and the new earth haven't come yet, and the final resurrection hasn't happened yet. And so when we go and die, we are not united back to our bodies yet. We, we will be in spirit. Now I think that we can be confident, like when when Paul says to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. I think we can be confident that our spirits will be with Christ and God in some way. I don't know what that's going to be like, but that we will be with the Lord, but we will be awaiting resurrection. Um, in, in Revelation 2, it says that, not chapter 2, but Revelation, it also says that like the saints are waiting in heaven and they're crying out, how long, O Lord? So it's like this place of waiting, right? So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a bad place, but it's a place of waiting because they don't, we aren't fully resurrected yet. Um, so, paradise and Abraham's, people call Abraham's bosom the place where the blessed souls are awaiting resurrection. Um, and then the last one is the beatific vision, which isn't a scriptural term either, but it's just the general uh, way that the Christian tradition has talked about what heaven's going to be like. It's just the direct presence of God, basically. We are seeing God in his perfect beatitude, which is where we get the term happiness. It comes from beatitude. Um, so, the beatific vision is be continually being in the presence of God. So just a brief overview of a ton of different biblical terms about the afterlife. Yeah, so that was a lot. <laughs> and probably the most interesting slide in here. I, I think it's the most interesting one in here. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay, but we're going to go to the next one, which is an actual like logical argument for why we should believe in general uh, for life after death. Like, why do we believe in life after death? Do we have a reason? Again, uh, when we were researching this, there were like, 10 to 20 arguments for everything. So like to believe in life after death, there was just like a ton of arguments and reasons of why we should just believe in it in general. I just picked one, the one that I think makes the most sense and is actually um, very relatable and what a lot of people could understand even if you're like you're evangelizing to someone because it, it's basing it off of justice or that idea like, hey, if someone does something bad, they should be punished, right? Um, so I think it's very helpful. So, so this argument, it starts with the premise, God is just. So uh, the Christian God is just. I don't think a lot of people would disagree with that. The Bible describes God like that. So God is just, as in he punishes bad things. 
all right? Next, his dealings must reflect this attribute. So this is God acts in accordance with his character, as in God would not do something unjust, okay? So given those two premises, we can move on to the next thing, which is, okay, in this life, the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer sometimes. So as in, we don't see that justice played out, as in, sometimes we don't see wickedness, wickedness punished, and sometimes we don't see righteousness rewarded or blessed. So that's what the wisdom series goes over. So like Proverbs is saying like, oh, um, if you do good, good things will happen. And if you do bad, bad things will happen. So be wise. But then Ecclesiastes is like, okay, all of this is pointless. Even righteous people suffer. And then Job like completes that. Um, and so then we're left wondering, well, is God just? All right. Well, that brings us to the next thing, which is there must be justice after death to compensate for the uh, for the before, uh, for the life before the death, right? So there must be something after this uh, to to right those wrongs in order for God to actually be just, okay? And then it moves to the last, uh, yeah, well, actually, yeah, that's it. That's what I said. Yeah, that's the whole argument right there. So it starts with the idea of God is just. So if someone believes that God exists, so maybe like a, a deist or someone that's not Christian or maybe someone that believes there's something out there, you can talk to them about it and say like, okay, this thing that's out there, mm -hmm. is it just, is, are things going to be punished? And then you work your way to the end and help them realize, hey, there's something after this and we need to deal with that right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. How does culture... Uh, how do they speak about these issues? How would culture respond to these doctrines of heaven and hell that are essential to the Christian faith, that are part of the gospel message? Um, what does culture say, and how do we approach the issue when we're trying to deal with this? Um, well, culture, as you know, they would say that this is dumb, or it's immoral, um, that God is unjust in his dealings here, that there must be some sort of immoral or injustice on, on God's part. Uh, many Christians would say that it shouldn't be preached very much, if at all. Uh, that hell just really shouldn't be preached, that God is love, therefore we shouldn't talk about hell. And there it is, just leave it at that. Um, but we think that that's not taking into the, the full counsel of God's word. Um, so those are some objections that we often have. Um, they also say that we can't have eternal punishment for simple, uh, simply temporal crimes, right? That, which on the face of it seems like, yeah, that, that does seem like an injustice. I think the way to respond to that is that uh, the sinning does not stop in this life. In hell, people are still sinning eternally. They're eternally set in their wills of rejection of God. And so the sinning does not stop. They're continually meriting the punishment that they are receiving because they're continually rejecting God, which is still sin in the highest sense. And so it isn't eternal punishment for temporal crimes. It's eternal punishment for eternal crimes. Um, but how do we talk about this issue with culture? right? How do we deal with this extremely difficult and heavy topic? Um, I would say that there is a certain style of preaching about hell that is unbiblical that I don't think works with what Jesus would say about hell. There's a certain style that would that speaks about hell almost in a triumphalistic way or an excited way. Like, I can't wait for this hell thing, and I'm like wanting you to go there almost. You get this with, with certain preachers, um, which I don't think is how Jesus talks about it. I think Jesus talks about hell a ton, but he speaks about it with an urgency and a sorrow Right? He's not speaking about it as, like, I can't wait for you guys to go there. No, it says that God doesn't take pleasure in the death of the wicked, that he desires all to come to repentance, that he's slow, he's, he's waiting for, for people to come to repentance, and he's not desiring uh, for people to be punished in this way. Um, so those are the biblical truths that we have to wrestle with. Um, but we, we shouldn't speak about hell in a sort of triumphalistic spirit. We need to be able to speak about it in love with people. People agree with the basic idea that wrongdoing must be punished, right? Everybody agrees with that basic idea. Um, we all have that innate desire within us to see justice done, okay? Because we're made in the image of God. We're moral creatures. Where the gap is, is that people need to grasp, and what they don't see is the true depths of humanity's sinfulness, right? What happens as you become a Christian and as you grow in sanctification is you, you continually see more and more and more of your own sinfulness of your heart, all right? That's certainly been my Christian experience. I, I hope it's uh, some of your guys' as well, that as you grow in your walk with the Lord, you become increasingly sensitive to the holiness of God and how corrupted your, yourself is, even as you grow towards him, um, because he's infinite holiness. 
And so that's the gap. People understand that wrongdoing must be punished, but they don't understand that for themselves. And they don't understand that as a whole for humanity. They think that humans are just basically pretty good. And if you're basically not Hitler, then you're basically fine. Um, but I think that the Bible doesn't speak of it like that. The Bible says that we're all thoroughly falling short of the glory of God. People will often ask something like, how could a good God send anyone to hell? And I think a good response, depending on the context, is with an equally difficult philosophical question is, how could a holy God send any sinners to heaven? That's just as difficult of a problem to deal with philosophically. Emotionally, we're only asking the first question, right? Because we think we're basically pretty good. But an equally difficult problem is, how could a holy God, who can't be in the presence of sin, send anybody to heaven? That's an equally difficult problem. And so, ultimately, the cross is the answer. The cross is where God's justice and his love meets, you know? And we get God being just in punishing sin, but also loving in providing a way of salvation for us. And so as we deal with this in culture, we have to preach the cross. We have to preach the whole counsel of God word, God's word. We need to speak the truth in love. We, our job is to introduce people to the person of Christ and have them encounter his holiness for themselves. We preach the gospel in its entirety, um, unashamed about it, and we let the spirit work in the other person and trust that God will do that. I got. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So application. Um, hell is scary, and it's a it is a reality that we should uh, live in knowledge of. We should we should live our lives knowing that hell is a reality and a possibility, and it should drive us away from ourselves. It should drive us away from sin. It should make us flee to God and His mercy. It should make us thankful for the cross, which should make us thankful that there is a way of salvation provided for us, right? We should have the urgency that Jesus had. Um, Jesus speaks constantly about hell. So I would say, do we have that sort of urgency in our own lives, in, in terms of our, our own pursuit of killing sin in our lives? Do we have that pursuit in terms of our family members? Do we have that pursuit with our friends? Um, another thing, though, is that yeah, I have, I have some stuff to say. <laughs> um, so, heaven will complete us. There's that. Uh, so we do have a design. We we have a teleology, so a, a design. We have a, a purpose. And our purpose originally was to be with God in the garden, but that got messed up. So when God finally brings that back, our design will be complete again. Mm -hmm. Okay? So think of it like this. Whenever you hear a, a store, actually J.R.R. Tolkien uh, pointed this out, but whenever you hear a story where like something something is wrong or something is like really right, you, you say two things. For the wrong thing, you're like, it, yeah, that happened, but it shouldn't be like that. Or for the good thing, mm -hmm. a lot of people will say, oh, that's just fairy tale. Um, the response is like, okay, yeah, it is, but something seems right about that. It should be that way. Good should win over evil, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there is that desire within us, and so. I think that's a good way to to think about it when you, when you see those situations and you get that desire like hey no that needs to be fixed like mm -hmm. there's something wrong with this world there um heaven is going to be the purging of everything that is wrong with this world the state that we're in is 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 not going to be anymore yeah. and so that's a good like look into how it how it might be but it's going to be even better than that mm -hmm. right yeah. um and then the next thing is that we need to contemplate this more so contemplate hell and heaven more to understand it because sometimes we just uh, kind of push it off, especially with the English language. We just give blanket terms. We're like, oh, yeah, heaven, hell. Okay, yeah, I want to go to heaven. And we don't actually understand what it is or, you know, we push hell away and we're just like, yeah, hell. And we use that blanket statement and don't actually understand what's happening there. Um, so we need to contemplate it more. But Colossians 3 um, talks about, like, having our minds and eyes on things above, on, on the things that are of Christ. <laughs> Um, and I think that has a lot to do with heaven and hell. Yeah. One other interesting thing is that other cultures, more ancient cultures, and also cultures today, especially like Eastern cultures, when they hear the gospel and they're encountered with the gospel, their struggle is much more with heaven than it is with hell in terms of they don't see God being just in forgiving anyone. So there hasn't been always the same problem with hell's bad and God's evil and bad and a meanie for sending people to hell. It's actually usually been the flip of uh, the Christian God being viewed as unjust for forgiving anybody. And so cultures have different objections to this, and so it's really our Western modern culture that has the most problem with the idea of hell more than heaven. I've heard of, like stories of, 
of people that go to preach to people in China, and it's the complete opposite objection. It's, I don't get heaven. People are just getting off scot-free. That's not just. <laughs> and so it's just kind of, you never know who you're going to encounter and what the actual objections are going to be with people. But it's important to just keep in mind God's love, his perfect love, and his perfect justice meet at the cross. It's kind of the important idea. And last application is that we need to make peace with God. Um, like, if you, have not, if, you have a, if you do not have a clean conscience, if, and you are not living with the Spirit testifying that you are a child of God, I urge you to do that. I urge you to take that step um, of faith today. Um, do not leave anything before him unconfessed or unclean, you know? So, make peace with God. And that last phrase is one of my favorite mottos. It says, bona conscientia paradisus, which just means a good conscience is paradise, which I love that. No matter what the circumstances are in your world, Nothing can be taken from the fact that you are completely forgiven in Christ and that is untouched by circumstances. That will never leave you, your good conscience with God. Um, so just to leave you with that. All right, we're going to do a prayer. And this prayer is a little different. We didn't write it this time. It's actually a prayer by Anselm, but it's really, really good. Um, so we can uh, fold our hands and, and bow our heads. Um, Lord, I'm afraid of my life. Uh, for when I examine myself carefully, it seems to me that my whole life is either sinful or sterile. But it is he himself, he himself is Jesus. The same is my judge, between whose hands I tremble. Take heart, sinner, and do not despair. Hope in him, whom you fear. Flee to him from whom you have fled. Jesus, Jesus, forget the pride which provoked you. See only the wretchedness that invokes you. Dear name, name of my delight, name of comfort to the sinner, name of blessed hope, for what is Jesus except to say, Savior? So Jesus, for your own sake, be to me Jesus. Amen. Yeah. All right. Um, so this will lead us to um, the Q&A. Any questions? Yeah. Any tomatoes to throw? <laughs> Tyler. Um, Tyler.